Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the April episode of the Backstory on Marketing. If you haven't already done so, please visit ProRelevant.com and sign up for all of these episodes and podcasts. I am the author of the upcoming book, The Post-COVID Marketing Machine, Prepare Your Team to Win. You can find more information on this at marketingmachine.prorelevant.com. Today, we'll be speaking with Angela Cannon. She is the Vice President and Channel Manager for Up Faith and Family. As, pres as Vice President and Channel Manager, Angela is responsible for management oversight of the subscription video on demand service for Up Faith and Family, which is a leading destination for uplifting entertainment. Previously, Angela was VP of National Accounts, Content Distribution, and Marketing, where she managed international program sales, distribution, and CDM focused marketing efforts for Aspire, Up TV, and Up Faith and Family. One of Canon's most notable accomplishments was being tasked with launching the Irvin Magic Johnson Aspire on June 27, 2012. Sounds really cool. I'm, we're going to talk about that. Along her career in entertainment, Canon has been the recipient of a whole bunch of awards. The Synopsis Best of the Best, New and Newsworthy Best SVOD 2022, Synopsis 2021, Top Women in Media Corporate Visionary Award, and a whole bunch of others, which I'm not even going to list. Welcome, Angela. So good to have you. Thank you, Guy. Thank you so much. Very nice to have you have you have me here today. <laughs> uh, absolutely, no problem at all. So, tell me, tell us what your uh, backstory is on how you got into marketing. Wow. Um, so, my story in terms of marketing is kind of varied in the fact that I started my career or thinking I was going to start my career in uh, medicine. So, I went back and um, my undergrad is in biology. And I decided that as I was, you know, working my way through college as a phlebotomist, um, I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. But I just so happened to be in the last uh, years of college and I not dare tell my mom I was going to change my, my major. So I um, went back to school later on for my MBA in marketing and I started my career in research. Um, <clears throat> at Warner Brothers and Disney and was just really always interested in marketing. And when I moved here to Atlanta, I started working at Gospel Music Channel and they allowed me not only to start their research department, but they also allowed me the opportunity to start the affiliate marketing department. And that is how my story of content distribution and marketing began. Oh, fantastic. You know, market research uh, is such a good grounding for marketers because you really find out how to understand what consumers are doing. That's that makes so much sense. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I started out at Warner Brothers doing the qualitative and quantitative um, research, and then I moved over to Disney. And in fact, the last project that I did was Grey's Anatomy um, and Desperate Housewives. I did, those are the last projects that I did in terms of focus testing. And, you know, it's amazing now to Thursday night, you know, still see Grey's Anatomy on there. So it was great to see that that's been going on for years. And I won't say how many years that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, that, uh, that program has been such a success. And yeah. there's so many competitors that have come up with that, you know, like Chicago Med, and I don't even know what the other ones are, but that one has really been a success. So that's a great kudos to you. That's for sure. Um, thank you. Well, I'll have to give that to Shonda Rhimes. So, but it was an amazing opportunity to, to be able to work with her doing that. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, um, in any case, well, so tell us a little bit about uh, Up Faith and Family. What's going on there? Yeah, Up Faith and Family. It's, you know, we call it our the leading streaming service for uplifting entertainment, um, movies, series, kids programming, um, <clears throat> clean comedy, uh, lifestyle programming, like um, cooking and cleaning, it, cooking and cooking, <laughs> cooking and design shows. I can't even talk today. Um, we have a little bit for everybody. So it's not what you typically think of as faith programming um, or even family programming for that matter. We make sure that we have 
you know, content for, for everybody, nine to 90, married or single, um, you know, you can find anything um, that you might think you might enjoy and even stuff that you may not be so sure about, but you find out at the end that you love it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was out uh, looking at the, some of the things you've gotten there. They're very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, it looks like uh, it's going to be a, uh, you know, a smashing success. So good for you. I hope Thank that you. research will be able to do the same thing it, it did for Grey's Anatomy as it'll do for Up Faith and Family. Yeah, you know what? It's nowadays, it's all about research and data, right? So. We yeah, will... absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm a data guy, so I love, <laughs> I love those four letter words, I guess. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Research and data. We, I mean, we, you know, most marketers, especially you know, the caliber that you are, uh, that is the, a critical, critical component for uh, for success. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us some of the marketing activities that you're doing and uh, for to promote the uh, you know the the service and and the and the channel. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, as with any brand, social media really has become, you know, part of marketing mixes, you know, whatever level it may be. So whether it's Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, and, and now, you know, a lot of brands are utilizing their LinkedIn profiles um, as a way to market and gain, you know, information or get information out to those valued customers or audiences. And these are all mediums that you know we use to as extensions of our brands so we're very careful to treat each one with intention because our overall purpose is to uplift someone and we try to make sure that we reflect that across all so you know within social we also have other marketing channels that we use for not only you know paid and organic marketing um, campaigns, but we're sure that ensure that we're reaching our audiences where they are, and also providing them with you know content, um, messaging, value ads that really allow us to use these vehicles to you know not only acquire new subscribers, um, but entertain them, engage them, um, retain them, delight them, and then in some instances we want to you know win them back if they've actually canceled off. Um, but it's definitely a full team effort, you know, with our social media teams, as well as our customer support team, um, because they're the ones on the front line, right, of customer interaction. And then, you know, overall, just organic marketing um, perspective, we do a lot um, in that regard. Um, you'll find a mix of promotion, not only across our brands, um, with Up TV and Aspire TV, which are our linear networks, but we also make sure that we're, you know, promoting our new titles every week. Um, we have new titles that come onto the service weekly. We have exclusive titles. Uh, we're very fortunate to have originals and acquire titles that are exclusive only to Paper Family. And so our social team is, you know, also really amazing at hosting sweepstakes and contests and things that, you know, really are going to engage our customers and, um, and particularly those that have loyal followings. We have some shows that have rabid fans and loyal followings. So, you know, we really try to make it a family affair and sometimes we'll do shout outs and birthdays conduct Facebook lives, talent interviews, you know, you name it. We really try to make sure that we make our social mediums and all the marketing that we do really reflect what we're, who we are, which is here to uplift someone. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm surprised though that you're using LinkedIn. I, I mean, I think LinkedIn is an undiscovered uh, social media channel for consumer brands. And so, uh, yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, you know, LinkedIn, we really, took a look at it oh, really over the last maybe two years. Um, it's more so ran by our HR department and um, PR. And what they do is really take a look at not only what we're doing from a PR perspective, making sure that the articles are out there, but also celebrating our employees. So you can go on there, whether you're new to the job or you've been there for a while, we try to make that a place where we celebrate one another. Um, and I think that within LinkedIn, because it is more B2B and or actually B2C in some cases when you're looking for new talent or, you know, also with other, you know, um, 
businesses that you want to reach out to or even make sure your competitors might know some of the things that you're doing. I think those are great. It's a great medium in which you can get all those things accomplished. And people expect it now, right? Everyone goes to, to LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you mentioned employees. Um, are you doing, uh, you know, one of the things that's really critical now is not only, you know, not only do you have to <clears throat> market for customers, but you have to market for employees and both re on the retention side and also on the acquisition side and, yeah. and uh, you know, and building your employee brand because it's so critical now with the, uh, you know, with all of the job changes going on in this post-COVID environment and all of the dynamics in the uh, employment world. Yeah, I mean, you know, COVID, right? Like, I'll, I'll just say it's like pre-COVID, post-COVID, hopefully, definitely post-COVID now. I'm hoping we're on the other side of that. Um, but, you know, the great resignation and a lot of people having that opportunity to really sit back and say, what is important to me? What is, you know, what do I need to do? in my life, in this world, for my family, for myself, what are the things that I've always wanted to accomplish? And I think people had the opportunity to do that while they were still working, you know, they're at home, they have that more of a work-life balance. And I think it's really important that companies show that, you know, they show that they understand the differences between pre and post COVID, that they are empathetic with the fact that people want to put families first and that they really think through what's important. Should, can you offer a hybrid schedule? Can people work from home? You have so many companies that have now decided to go completely remote. And, you know, I heard um, one of my friends the other day is, is a recruiter and she was like, some of the companies now that are making you go back into the office completely are definitely not getting this kind of um, percentage of new applicants that they had once gotten, you know, pre-COVID. So I think it's really important that employees understand now that as a company, you know the differences of, of what's important in life and that you are taking care of your employees and that you um, show them that. And you can show them that on LinkedIn by how you celebrate your employees, how what you talk about. Do you have, you know, benefits that or perks that might be different from, you know, the norm? So those are places where you can talk about those things that we just haven't really had to do in the past. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, this whole concept of return to office or maybe not return to office and. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday and, and they have a uh, mandatory two to three days a week in the office. And he said uh, he's, he's unable to hire people. People keep turning them down because of that lack of flexibility. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, so that whole process and getting the right offer and the flexibility and the benefits is, uh, is pretty critical. And the reason why I bring that up is that uh, that same person, he says, the growth of my company is limited by my ability to hire people. Mm. On, the one I, on the one hand, they have these policies that are holding them back. On the other hand, that policy is limiting their growth because they can't hire the stuff, the people to be able to do the projects that they need to be able to get the, the new products and new capabilities out that they want to be able to grow their business. It's a circle, right? It is. But I think that at some point, companies are really going to have to lean in to the nuances and the, and the newness of what's happening in our world and be okay with allowing people to make their schedules that work for them. Um, just my opinion. Of yeah. course, I, that's higher than my pay grade, but <laughs> that's just, you know. <laughs> That's just my opinion. Yep, exactly, exactly. Well, uh, let me uh, let me change the subject on you. So, who do you, uh, who is your uh, target market for uh, of faith and family? And then, uh, what do you do to really be very specific in how you target your marketing? Awesome question. Um, so we're you know very much aware that when you see the name faith and family, it can appear. Um, limiting, right, to the kinds of programming that you will find on our service. However, um, we've done research. <laughs> That's my thing, right? But we've done a lot of research over the years, and we know that there's about 40 million plus 
you know, people that we call the upsiders. And that's people that are seeking positive and, and driven, you know, content, positive and values driven content. So faith in most places can mean, you know, that you're getting hit over the head with Sunday sermons or, you know, the fire and brimstone scriptures, but, but not on a faith and family, not at all. So we carefully curate our content so the entire family can enjoy. So just like I said, whether you're young or old, married, single, you will always be able to find, you know, programming with, you know, faith films that have a redemption message with kids programming that really make sure that we're careful about how we, um, if we have to edit in some cases, we make sure that parents understand with, through disclaimers, we make sure that they understand that we are in this with them and we want to make sure that this is a safe environment for anyone, everyone to be able to watch and enjoy content. Um, so to answer your question, our target mar market really is not only faith-centric audiences and we're very unique in that regard. So we're able to go broader, right? But however, <clears throat> like most businesses, the new privacy policies and also the elimination of specific targeting, um, particularly on Facebook has prompted us to diversify and broaden our reach. So, you know, quite frankly, because of those limitations, it has allowed us to be more innovative and be more um, creative in our approach and how we're doing our marketing and really thinking outside of the metaverse, um, you know, seeking those upsiders wherever they are. Yeah, absolutely. And I could imagine uh, thought about that, but the targeting with, uh, you know, if part of your audience is children, uh, you know, and the, the very strict controls and limitations that you have really does force you to be creative in, in terms of how you reach that, uh, that market or the parent market uh, that's related to it. Absolutely. You know, you have to go after the parents, they're the ones with the money, but, you know, particularly when you're going through social channels and things like that, but it's very, um, the, the way we do it, in, in my opinion, fosters an environment of safe and fosters an environment of values driven. And I think that alone, you know, parents are definitely looking for that in our world now and with so many choices and so many, you know, varying perspectives, they're just looking for some place where, you know, they feel that family is safe. Yeah, and you know, and there's so many opportunities to to go wrong, so to speak, and uh, and I think you're so right. There are so many uh, families or family oriented parents that really want to, or values oriented fam uh, parents that really want to make sure that their children are exposed to the right things and as best as possible. It's hard on the internet. It's very hard. It's, it's very hard to expose them to the to the wrong things, so to speak. So. Yeah. You know, good for you. I'm surprised it's only 40 million. I would have thought that I, I would have hoped maybe that it would have been higher. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've been doing this research for years and I'm sure, you know, that's why we say the plus, right? Because that's what we can kind of ascertain through our research. But I'm certain that there's many more that really just want to see positive entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, especially when you're targeting children, well, and I, I don't mean to say targeting children. You're not targeting children. No, 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 Which, we're not. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, you know, that brings up a very, uh, a really tough question is first party data and, and the control of that, because you, if you, you getting that hacked or, you know, just being protected in that number one, and then also your policies on how you're actually using that uh, in some fashion to, to help you know uh, grow the business, retain your customers, and what have you. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, you know, on my team, we really kind of have driven this conversation of of the digital atmosphere here for Up Entertainment, and uh, we have a saying that you know, content is king, the data is the kingdom. Um, so our, our head of, of technology and innovation, he has created a tech stack that puts first party data at the core of our data set. And it truly allows for a greater ROI 
and more value to our customers through you know, personalized content and, and also communication. So it allows um, us a basis to understand historically and of course, real-time events as customers are, you know, how they're interacting with our service. But also, again, it allows us a way to lean in and create lookalike audiences from data that is coming directly from our customers and particularly customers that have um, high engagement levels, um, customers that are coming back more than once or twice a week. Um, so we're able to really kind of hone in on them. And we have the ability to cut and dice the data, whether it's by region, by viewing patterns and behaviors. Um, we also have taste preferences. Um, taste preferences is essentially just allowing the customer to tell us exactly what they want to see on the front end of their subscription. And, you know, of course, recommendation opportunities. So, you know, as people interact with us and they start their subscription, they ultimately give us valuable data. And then that data, you know, again, affords us the abilities to gain customers um, at a greater percentage while, you know, really understanding that streaming is a churn business, right? You get them in and sometimes you fortunately you churn them out quicker than you want. So it's really about understanding, you know, your job and our job is to make sure that we fill the funnel consistently with new customers that have a high propensity to start a free trial um, that will convert to becoming a paid customer. Um, if they're a monthly subscriber that they're going to convert, you know, or we can upgrade them to an annual subscription. Um, all of that in an effort to lower churn and increase our LTV, our lifetime value. Yeah, absolutely. You, you mentioned on the, uh, on the, I guess the subscription process where you're capturing preferences data. Do you uh, uh, reach out very often to get them to update that and, and give you kind of a well, you know, I said this in the beginning, but now I kind of like that. Do you get that data as well? We do. So we're very fortunate to have an audience insights team that, you know, we are able to run quarterly or maybe even biannually surveys on our customers. So we can get a good understanding of, you know, what's changed for them? Um, how are they feeling? And that really helps us to not only gauge them and their opportunities on the front end of their subscription, but also throughout it, particularly if they're our longtime customers and really help us from a programming perspective to see like what's working, what's not working, what do we need to acquire more of? Maybe, maybe we pull back on this particular category. We do a lot of testing um, with our content so, you know, we do, we, A-B testing is our life. Um, so we really utilize all of these elements in order to make sure that we're offering and subscribing the best, um, you know, experience, customer experience across a lot of different avenues. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that testing and, and constant learning and constant uh, insights gathering is so critical to, to success. And in your case, you know, not only success on the acquisition, but you know, potentially also on the on the retention. And uh, uh, so I wanted to go on to maybe another question. So, uh, but let me preface it with um, about a, a three or four days ago, our Apple TV went out. And, okay. and uh, so we're now like we have Amazon, we had Amazon and Apple TV. We're not a big subscriber to, uh, and I apologize, I'm not a subscriber to Upfaith and Family. But- Will be after today. Will be after today. <laughs> so, um, but now we're trying to decide. My wife says, "Oh, I don't want any of that Macintosh stuff. Let me let's get the Roku." And uh, and I've been so busy the last couple of days uh, that I haven't had a chance to actually sign up for it. You know, on our on our on our TV. So uh, uh, so are we able to find uh, a faith and family on Roku then? Absolutely, right. absolutely. You can do it two ways actually on Roku. You can either have our direct app that you can just get our download our app onto Roku or Roku channels also has a page and family. Okay. So once you get it going, you can search us out, search a faith and family and we're right there on Roku. All right, fantastic. So which one do you recommend or is the, uh, is it both the same, whether you go it's with- It's both the same, it's both the same, but you know, if you want to take it with you, go ahead and get that app, download the app and you can yeah. download and view on the road. 
Absolutely. Well, and that then uh, gets to the multi-screen environment. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I watch TV or the news or whatever, you know, on my iPad, on my iPhone, on my laptop, and then, of course, on the TV and whatever. And, and uh, that's got to really be a, a, a challenge for you and your industry to really understand what's going on and how your viewers then are actually uh, consuming your content. You know, I don't know if it's so much of a challenge as it is the ability to keep us on our toes. So for instance, I, I look at that as being an enriched viewing experience for everyone. Um, because, you know, I'm not even close to being a Gen Zer by any means, but I have my phone with me, you know, all the time. Um, <laughs> So I'm never far from, from my phone, but there are several stout stats out there now that, you know, we pick up our phone as much as 90 times a day up to as high as I heard, you know, like 300 times a day. It's incredible how much we check in to see, you know, if we have a new text, we have a phone call, we miss some notifications, um, wait to see if anybody liked our post on Instagram. Um, but, you know, if you think about the overall viewing experience, long gone are the days of a laid back experience and, you know, you and watching your TV on your couch with no interruptions, you know, we use our phones, we use our tablets to enhance that experience through, you know, either researching the actors, you know, what other movie did they star in, um, what date did that movie come out. Um, I know for me, it allows me the opportunity to go and look at their social pages. Um, if there's a particular movie page or if there's a service page, you know, I find myself on, you know, um, Netflix a lot or Hallmark a lot, of course, Update the Family a lot to see if there's any additional um, information that will gain me a greater experience or a greater knowledge base of that particular movie that I'm watching or series that I'm watching. Um, so again, I feel like, you know, use, the usage of our phones and our tablets has just, again, enriched the way in which we view content. So if anything, um, not only do I think it's improved our industry holistically, but I also think that it's, you know, a, a value add for, for viewers. And yes, it does, it does make marketers even more so savvy about, having a buy through marketing message on all of those different elements. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and we're guilty of that. And I don't know if I'm in the 300 range on my phone, but <laughs> I hope I'm not, but I don't know. I'm going to have to start checking I'm afraid to count. It would be awful. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, uh, my wife and I do quite often, we'll be, you know, watching something and we'll say, I wonder if, you know, who is that or who was that? Or, you know, and, and then we'll go and, and look them up and then, you know, and, and just like you, you said, the other thing I've noticed, though, is that uh, the use of uh, QR codes on uh, and certainly on the commercials now. And yeah. uh, now I will admit one of the challenges I've had, I've never been able to get my I've never been able to pick up my oh, phone no, up. <laughs> to be able to take a picture of the QR code to get it actually to link over. And, uh, but uh, do you see something like that uh, influencing what you guys are doing? Absolutely. We've been using QR codes now for about a year. And, you know, we're constantly testing and getting better at it every day. But we just really feel like not only QR, I feel like the QR code has made a resurgence, right? I remember using it when it first came out, probably back in 12 or 13. Um, when, especially when we just had launched um, Aspire. But now it kind of went away. And then when COVID came back, it seems like it's back everywhere, right? You can have a QR code at the restaurant to get your menu. So you're not, you're ha having a contactless experience at, you know, while you're eating. Um, and even now with our spots, that's exactly what we do. We put them on our spots and we make sure that we're tracking everything, you know, all the way down to, um, where it was linked, but I really feel like it's a way that people have become accustomed to just getting their phone, putting it on there, going to the website, making that transaction really easy and seamless, um, because that's the point, right? You want to make sure that your customer doesn't have any friction. It's a frictionless transaction, and um, the more you're able to do that and to really um, get to the point where 
they feel like you've made it super easy for them, then I feel like you would have a, a customer for a longer period of time. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's interesting um, when you talk about QR codes originally coming out versus now, uh, the big difference is that the QR code, you had to previously have a QR code reader to be mm -hmm. able to recognize the QR code. Now, Apple and, and, and uh, you know, and all the iPhones uh, and Android have built that into the camera. So when I shine my, my thing on the QR code, then it automatically recognizes that. Right. Uh, last, yeah, last night I was at a, uh, an event. We were doing an event with, uh, on, on virtual reality. And um, uh, and I I apologize. I don't mean to have wine on my desk, <laughs> but uh, we had it on here. And so there's now uh, you, the labels have uh, uh, QR uh, have uh, virtual reality. And the difference though is that the um, you have to download an app. And so I have a feeling that the VR that's on on the different bottles of wine or different products, it doesn't really matter. But mm -hmm. the VR that's on those, if they can get it native inside the camera on, you know, on the Apple, you know, the iPhone or on the Android, then yeah. I think the VR will really, really take off at that point. So I totally agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So what other, what other trends do you see coming up here now, now that we're looking at uh, post COVID or hoping that we're post COVID? So what kind of interesting marketing trends do you see? You know, I think um, just having to be really careful about data, really, um, because from a trends perspective, there's so many different things from a marketing perspective, I should say. Um, data has really afforded us the opportunity to, um, like I said earlier, our first party data has really afforded us the opportunity to, you know, really understand our audiences. But because of the privacy policies and the things that have happened, it is going to really be um, an area where marketers are going to have to focus um, their efforts to really kind of learn nuances and new things that are coming down the pike. And one of those things, you know, I don't know if recently if you saw, but Netflix um, has added gaming to their service. So, um, you know, that is a pro for sure, because you have millions and millions and millions of gamers in the world and they experience gaming through, you know, niche outlets, but in, in some instances, probably disjointed experiences, but Netflix saw that void and, and they capitalized on that opportunity. So I think if there's other technologies or other data sources that will allow us to kind of chime into what's hot what's not, you know, what's actually swaying customers' attention, that's how marketers are going to be most successful in their jobs. We have to really be ahead of the curve and we have to figure out, you know, what, what technology is coming, is coming down the pike that could work for you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the trends is, is, yeah. is gaming yeah. and adding, adding gaming into, to there, but also again, just being really cognizant about 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 data yeah yeah no i, I think you're right i think um, uh and data is going to get more I, I have a feeling is going to get more clamped down and clamped down as as uh you know as the regulations and and what have you kind of uh evolve but it's kind of interesting that you bring up netflix with their with their gaming one of the biggest challenges that marketers have is how do you reach the male you know 25 to 35 uh, because they're not on the traditional media channels, and and uh, and so then gaming is certainly one way that you can uh, you know reach them, reach also the the women in the same age, but the uh, but that male twenty five to thirty five really really tough to reach, and if Netflix is able to crack that with their offering in gaming, that could be a real value for a lot of advertisers that want to take advantage of that. Yeah, I mean, I in my opinion, I really think it's a game changer, right? Because I think there's another opportunity in animation. You know, you have a lot of um, 3D and 2D animators that are also male centric in, in some instances. You And then you have, again, like I said, the gaming part of it. So it's really kind of finding out what makes men tick. And I haven't cracked that curve yet, so. <laughs> I haven't either. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, but I think that that is definitely one way to do it. And and you're right. If the there, I'm sure they're having some success with that. And you know, advertisers overarchingly, obviously Netflix doesn't have advertising like that, but I think they'll start to see maybe some other opportunities, whether through their social media platforms or, you know, start taking other extensions from the gaming that they just have on the platform and utilizing it maybe through YouTube or whatever. I'm sure they're going to figure out what other revenue generating opportunities are going to be there for them on that. Yeah, and they definitely are a, a leader in the industry in, in so many ways. And uh, with them now taking, you know, such a, a strong offering or putting out a, such a strong offering with gaming, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves and then how all of the other competitors, uh, you know, evolve behind them. And, uh, and maybe that'll be an opportunity for you is to offer kind of a family friendly or family value centric gaming in some fashion. So, yeah, you know, maybe, I mean, that you say competition right so you know that is definitely a topic that we should talk about <laughs> um because streaming has exploded but then so has avod and so has fast but you know you see all of these niche uh svods and they come into play and then you're also now seeing um a lot of the large mega corporations merging and then they're combining their content together into more even more robust services so i think monday i think um you're going to see that discovery's acquisition of warner media come into play mm -hmm. so you have not only a discovery catalog but that has varied content right so it can be anywhere that's male centric female centric you know you have all the reality you have um i think they're actually losing the skip and joanna i mean chip and joanna Gaines content is going to hbo now but you know you have all of this content and then you bring on the warner media catalog with all of these notable movies it's a huge effect it's a vast and varied you know library so you have that ability to tap into all of those different audiences, you know, at one, just one service. Um, and then, you know, think about what Disney has done too with bundling. So you get Disney Plus and you get ESPN, you get Hulu. So, you know, consumers now, they have opportunity to have several, several services. And I think the average is three to four, maybe even five services. And no longer is that decision only Netflix. So they had to come up with, with something, right? And you have Amazon Prime, like you talked about earlier, and you have Disney Plus, and you have a Faith and Family, because mm -hmm. of course, I'm going to plug my own service. But you know, um, it really requires the opportunity to be innovative, to be creative, to be hyper targeted, to think about those voids in the market, and make sure that you totally and completely understand your audiences and that you continue, you know, continue to promote your unique value proposition. And in ours, it's because we want to uplift someone. Mm. Well, you know that, uh, and that's um, I, one of the challenges that I have is, uh, uh, well, it's twofold. One is there are so many different offerings. It, you know, you go into a grocery store and there's maybe a hundred thousand different things that you could buy in a grocery store. And, and you know, that, that amount of choice is now almost the same as what you have on these, uh, on the subscription or, or other services. And, uh, and that's just, you know, it, it, it's almost, it's, it's just too much. And then you don't know, you know, are they really worth it? And so, you know, you ask your friends, do you really, you know, like this, do you like that? And, and then um, I don't know about you, but uh, I have signed up for so many services for my business and my wife as well for her business. And yeah. you know, I got all these monthly charges going and I just, we just kind of said, we are going to limit, you know, our monthly charges because it's just so many. Yeah, out of control. And, then, yeah. and you don't know when to turn them off. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes back to, you know, the bundling aspects, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are going to really kind of take companies that are offering that opportunity, they're going to take them up on it because you're going to get, you know, your, your family content, your sports content and your movies and your broadcast TVs all in one, all in one payment. Right. But then you're also going to go after the ones that make it a little bit easier, you know, so payment gateways that make it a little bit easier, but you're also going to make sure that 
you're getting something that everyone in the family can enjoy. And I think, you know, for, for Epic and family, not only, again, our value proposition is to be offering that, something that everyone in the family can enjoy, but we do it at a price point that's not gonna hurt your pockets um, that much. And I think ultimately, what you get in that value will, you know, definitely be higher um, on your on your list of priorities of what you're going to do per month because of that, because it is value build for back to you. Yeah, no, and that makes a lot of sense. And uh, and I, I think uh, I think consumers are, uh, you know, in my my example is way too extreme, but uh, I think people are, you know, starting to figure out, you know, how to trade off the different things to make sure they're getting everything. And, and I like the way you put it as well as, uh, you know, are you getting the sports and the family and the other entertainment or whatever in yeah. the bundle, or do you have to buy it, you know, separately at, uh, in some other way? So it makes yeah. a lot of sense, just as long as I get to see the Braves once in a while. I'm okay. <laughs> That's all that matters. That's <laughs> all that matters. And the opener last night, were you out there? No, you know, I was, I really thought about it, but my wife and I, we went to two of the playoff games last season and I uh, we just blew all that money on that. I, I can't do it again, even though I really, really wanted to. <laughs> Understood. Yes. How did they do, by the way? You know what? I don't even know. I hope they won. <laughs> we were bad Braves fans then. <laughs> all I know is there was a lot of people out there. <laughs> good. That's good. That's good. Well, after they won, I'm, you know, it's so, it's so exciting. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, um, any last uh, things or one one more uh, nugget that you'd like to uh, give the our listeners or? Um, listeners, you know, I just think again, I I I know I've talked a lot about data, but I just think that you know, thinking through how you utilize your data. Um, and understanding how the data privacy is affecting, you know, marketers, it can be, you know, a pro and a con. And I think, you know, marketers probably should think about those, you know, a pro in the fact that, you know, you're getting highly qualified leads, you know, back to your service or back to your product, whatever that may be. But a con, because of course you're getting a smaller pool of leads because, you know, people have to actually opt in. Um, to say, yes, you can utilize my data. And, you know, unless you have viable content, compelling content, you have your value propositions listed out where they can surely see what it is, you know, a small, very small percentage are actually going to opt in. So we, again, as, as marketers, my last bit is just to really understand the data, understand your consumers and go after them where they are. Yeah. Well, and I think too, uh, people are willing to give you data uh, if they get something in return for it. And if you can show that link that it's really and truly there, then uh, you know, then they are more willing to do that. Now, now for me, um, I'm a, a marketer, so I unfortunately I sign up for everything and drives my wife crazy. And I <laughs> you could use my data because I want I want to see you know how the data gets used. And yeah. uh, so we were just in the market for a new car and we bought a new car. And uh, so we went out to a couple of sites and I was surprised at how good some of the marketers were and how bad some of the other ones were. Yeah. Uh, Hyundai was definitely the best. We were looking for an SUV and within a, a, a couple of hours, they had an ad on my TV. Mm. You know, we had gone out, you know, looking at it uh, on our iPad and uh, GM was a day or two behind, and then the rest of them were nowhere to be seen. Wow. So I was really, really surprised, especially when you're buying something that's, you know, of that value, you yeah, yeah. They would have invested in that data. And so I think to your point, you know, if you use that data right, um, and obviously with permissions, but uh, if you use that data right, there is a lot of money that can be had. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's just all about really making sure you take the time to understand what people are looking for and meeting them where they are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Angela, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the time today. And uh, I know, <laughs> you know, we've been uh, interrupting your emails and stuff like that. And uh, you it's- know, I'm so sorry, I turned it off. Though. 
<laughs> no, I didn't mean it that way. But uh, you know, it, it, like I, we were talking about, Friday is uh, so email driven, and uh, and I had a phone call come in, and I I thought I turned it off, but it still rang. So we're all guilty. I mean, and, and Friday is, I guess, the worst for that. But anyway, uh, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. And. Um, yeah, and otherwise, then uh, please uh, sign up for other episodes and the podcast series. And uh, if you get a chance, please rate this podcast with five stars. Angela, thank you so much. Thank you, Guy. Appreciate it.